And now we're joined by Kevin Gastala, managing editor of shadowproof.com. Kevin, thank you so much for joining the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So let's just get right into the latest news. Uh, so Julian Assange's legal team submitted this bail application for Julian, uh, hoping that he might be released on bail. And it was denied by Judge Barrister on the basis that he might not show up, uh, he might not return to court. The UK is currently on a maximum lockdown because of COVID-19, but they feel like he might uh, flee the country or something. So what are the implications of this for the case and what do you make of the ruling? The decision by the judge shouldn't have much bearing on the appeal and whether the United States government wins or loses at the High Court of Justice. But what it does mean is that Julian Assange is not free. Um, and at least you will not have any conditional liberty, which is rather absurd when you consider the fact that two days ago, this same judge granted an extradition or, or sorry, uh, denied an extradition request from the U.S. government on the grounds that Julian Assange is going through uh, a recurring mental health disorder. Um, he's on the autism spectrum. He suffers from psychological duress, and if he was extradited to the United States and, and put in a U.S. prison, particularly a supermax prison under special administrative measures where he was held in highly restrictive conditions and cut off from his friends and family, that that would lead him to be very highly committed to pursuing suicide, and he likely would take his life and the U.S. prison system would not prevent that from happening. Well, uh, she is keeping him in the Belmarsh prison and denying him the ability to be with his family during this appeal. And I ask, wouldn't that also cause him the same kind of duress that she was trying to avoid by denying this extradition request that the United States government sought? Uh, you, you tweeted out this theory that Assange is being denied, uh, Assange being denied bail is a, you know, really benefits the United States or really sort of, uh, you know, suits their, their goal, which is ultimately to shut up Julian Assange. While he might not be extradited to uh, the U.S. for prosecution, he's also not going, he's not being let free, like you said. And ultimately, he will not speak out. He will not be able to speak out about the injustices in his case. Uh, he will not be able to speak out about the multiple intelligence agencies that have been attacking him uh, while he was in the Ecuadorian prison um, and beyond that. So, you know, really, uh, is, this, is this really a victory or should we be very cautious about what is happening right now? Well, I think you're pointing out something critical here, which is, had Julian Assange been allowed to leave Belmarsh prison and, and go live on house arrest with his fiance and his two children, we likely would have heard from Julian Assange for the first time in almost two years, if not longer, because he would have likely made some kind of statement um, thanking his supporters at the very least. Maybe you wouldn't engage on specifics related to the case because there's still an ongoing appeal. But we would have at least heard Julian Assange's voice. And it seems like that's exactly what the U.S. government did not want. Probably one of the main reasons why they wanted the judge to uphold this idea that he would flee the country if he was granted bail. Um, and, and that the, the belief that he would flee is based upon a lot of prejudices that stem from his actions back in 2010 through 2012. And one point that his lawyer made is that the terrain has fundamentally shifted. He won. He won the stage at the district court level because the U.S. government's extradition request was rejected. And so typically that would come with the defendant or the person who was accused, even under an appeal, that would come with that person being allowed out of prison while they waited for that appeal to unfold because they had prevailed. But Vanessa Baretzer, this judge, I think we need to look at it from her perspective and, and how she is basically making herself the center of 
this case here. It's not about what's in Julian Assange's interest. It's about what's in Vanessa Baretzer's interest. And Vanessa Baretzer did not want to own a decision where Julian Assange was sent to the United States and potentially wound up dead in a U.S. prison. But she's perfectly fine with saying, hey, let me let the High Court of Justice, a, a panel of judges, there'll be three judges, let me ha have them look at this and see if perhaps there are assurances that could be extracted from the U.S. government. And maybe they'll think that I was incorrect about how I ruled. But if they decide I'm incorrect, at least it's not me who's making the decision to send Julian Assange to the United States. Because that way, I won't be responsible and my name won't be attached to this in a highly negative way for the rest of my judicial career. Right. And of course, as you said, the, the judge rejected uh, the extradition on the basis of the suicide risk, but accepted most of the U.S.'s arguments uh, as far as you know, espionage and uh, why, why he needs to be prosecuted on a political basis. Uh, can you just talk about um, the, the sort of significance of that? Well, the significance is that if you read her decision, she lays out all of these examples of why she believes Julian Assange is not a journalist and, in fact, engaged in criminal activity. And all of them are from and, and borrowed from uh, an individual named Gordon Cromberg, who is the assistant U.S. attorney who put forward these official statements. They were affidavits that were provided as a kind of defense for the government bringing this case against Julian Assange. It was passed over to the Crown Prosecutor, and then it was treated as evidence, and there was never an opportunity for the legal team, for Assange's legal team, to cross-examine and question Gordon Cromberg during the extradition trial. It was treated as, like, incontrovertible fact that what he was saying was truth, and the judge ended up treating it as truth. And basically, there's a lot of scurrilous and very highly uh, distasteful claims made about WikiLeaks and their regular conduct, suggesting that they're in the business of hacking and basically function as a criminal enterprise. And those are all planted there. I mean, a lot of that is born out of what U.S. intelligence agencies push and promote about WikiLeaks. People like Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, who when he was CIA director, gave in his first speech as CIA director, um, a, a, a very, uh, he, he spent a lot of time attacking WikiLeaks, calling it a hostile non-state intelligence uh, service and, and not a media organization. And she seems to believe that this is exactly what WikiLeaks and Julian Assange are about. And so she ate up all of these claims that were put to her by prosecutors and seems to believe that also the Espionage Act is almost identical to the Official Secrets Act in the United Kingdom and that he did violate the Official Secrets Act. And I find that to be remarkable just because here in the U.S., we do not have a law that says it is a, it is a crime to publish classified information in the same way that the United Kingdom does. But nevertheless, the Justice Department in recent years have used the Espionage Act the way they are going after Julian Assange. They've used it to basically criminalize any publication of sensitive national security information. And, and finally, obviously this case has been huge news in the journalism world, in the political world, but for people who see this news and who say, you know, well, they might even say what's happening is unfortunate, what's happening is unfair, but what can we do and, and why should I care? What is your message to those people? My message is that even if you don't care because you aren't a journalist, you should at least care that the U.S. government is able to set a precedent that could and, and likely will mean that we see other governments throughout the world take this as a green light, that they can target journalists from just about any country and use their power, especially if we consider countries like, you know, whether it's China, Russia, it could be Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Brazil, uh, Israel. Um, those are examples I usually cite because they do have some power throughout regions in the world. 
uh, they, they themselves might decide that they want to go after correspondents and target them for publishing stories about their own government uh, work, their national security operations, their involvement in military operations, things that they don't want the public to know. And so people who aren't journalists should care that this is allowing governments around the world to benefit from a precedent where they will be able to continue to enforce darkness and keep information from the people that they should know about what is happening to them in their daily life.